everyone, I'm McCain Vogel. And I'm Jay Baxter. And welcome, welcome to, to Conservation, Conservation Ag, Ag Update. Conservation Ag Update is brought to you by Martin Till. Thank you very much for that intro, McCain and Jay, all the way from Georgetown, Delaware. Welcome to the show. So, of course, it's been a wet growing season for many of you. Take Southern Indiana no-tiller Ray McCormick, for example. A heavy downpour on May 14th drowned about 80% of his corn in a 250-acre field and really set back his growing season ever since. Stressful stuff indeed for the 2024 Conservation Ag Operator Fellow. But it could have been much worse if he didn't have cover crops on all his acres and if he didn't have this heavy-duty Horsch Maestro 2430SW corn planter. He switched from a John Deere planter in 2014 to overcome problems he was having with rivets ripping out of the Deere planter's true V openers and too much disturbance from the fertilizer boot. So during a recent no-till farmer webinar, McCormick showcased something very unique about this planter. The first thing you might notice is there's no row cleaner. There's no coulter, row cleaner, or anything. So I wanted a planter. If you believe in minimum soil disturbance, then I didn't like this raking all the residue over and disturbing the residue and so forth. And Paul Jessup, the famous guy from Nebraska that does all the research on Motil, he's the only one I ever saw. He does a presentation on why you should use a low planer because you have a cleared off area, you have a heavy residue area, and so you have non-uniformity in the soil or at the soil surface. He wants perfect uh, uniformity. So when I don't move anything, then you have a hard time finding the row. So if you say, I want to go out and see how it's closing the slot, you have a hard time even finding the slot because of so little disturbance. One of the keys to doing that is you have to have these superior disc openers. And these are far bigger. These are forged steel. And these are bigger and sturdier and have a great bearing system. And you can catch McCormick's full planner walkthrough on notillfarmer.com and in the August issue of No-Till Farmer's Conservation Tillage Guide. Check your mailbox. It's coming next week. All right, let's keep the planter talk going now. Chris Perkins, who lives about 40 miles east of McCormick, calls his planter a cheat code. It's helped him break the 300 bushel barrier multiple times. Now, the 2024 Strip Till Innovator Award recipient's John Deere 1775 Exact Emerge planter has hydraulic downforce, auto path, and a 2x2x2 two by two by two setup that allows for precise fertilizer placement. And he also has chains on his planter, which he says have some pros and cons, but ultimately deliver ROI in more ways than one. It's simple, it's practical, it's a pain in the butt. Sometimes I'm not real crazy about them and then other times I absolutely love them. But one of the things that, that I love to do, um, it does not concern me. When I look at a forecast, if I see that, you know, hey, I've, I've got five days, I'm gonna be in the, in the 70s, 80s, whatever, and there's no rain coming, I'll sock that corn in three, three and a quarter inches deep. Doesn't worry me a bit. Well, one of the things that I noticed that the chains did when I was running, you know, whether it's poly twisters or furrow cruisers or whatever, they poke and they knead, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I read an article where some research had been done where even though we couldn't see the light that might be getting down into that seed trench, it was present to the plant and it could cause it to kind of come out to follow that path. Well, them chains just eliminated that. It just took that and smoothed okay. that all out. So that's why I did it for a more even. As far as running it because of the starter here, I'm not real worried about that. Okay, yeah. that's just an extra. Yeah, I did it more for, for emergence on the corn was the biggest reason. Learn more about Chris's equipment cheat codes on striptillfarmer.com. Right now, let's send it over to McCain Vogel for today's Cover Crop Connection. Thanks, Noah. McCain Vogel here with this week's Cover Crop Connection. Georgetown, Delaware no-tiller Jay Baxter was planning on conducting a cover crop experiment with oats, but when Mother Nature got in the way, he quickly pivoted to another idea for a different type of cover crop experiment. We've, we've configured a, an actual corn planter to plant wheat with um, to get it on 30 inch centers in a twin row. That way we can get the soybeans growing in between it in the spring. So we come in, we plant our, our, our winter wheat in the fall, 
it got late on us and and so we stopped and, it, and it, then it got extremely wet and so that turned into well why don't we do an experiment and let's grow some oats which we knew we could plant spring oats um, on the rest of the field so kind of that back corner was left fallow for the winter with the intention of coming back but it seemed like every three weeks we'd get like six inches of rain and it was it was Anyway, long story short, we never finished the experiment. So now we've got full season soybeans planted in 30 inch rows and soybeans planted um, in intercrop wheat 30 inch rows and they were planted within a day of each other. So that's enough experiment in itself. So everything can turn into an experiment if you try hard enough. So there's our soybeans. Yeah, they're kind of they're kind of thirsty for some water. But research shows us if we uh, if we we keep a keep a soybean plant under stress until it's um, until it starts to go in its reproductive mode, then it tends to put on more yield. And so we're intentionally not running this irrigation. But when you look at this, it's hard to it's hard to turn your back on a withered up soybean plant. Baxter says the current weather of 85 degrees and 95% humidity might be a little too extreme and it might be necessary to run irrigation just to keep the soybeans alive if rain doesn't come in the next day or two. Well, that's all for this week's Cover Crop Connection. Until next time, I'm McCain Vogel. Back to you, Noah. Thank you very much, McCain. All right, switching gears to a story out of Florida where a large drone dealer after multiple alleged FAA violations can no longer fly drones over 55 pounds. Here's what happened. FAA officials showed up to a training session hosted by the dealer and learned that the pilot in command allegedly didn't have registration for the drone and he was also flying it too close to a non-participating farmer. So for some perspective, we reached out to Adam Gittins, president of Harlan, Iowa-based drone dealer HTS Ag, and Adam says this case serves as a harsh reminder to make sure all your boxes are checked before flying drones. Let me try and make an analogy here. What was happening, this person was driving a vehicle with no license plates on it. But not only did it not have license plates on it, it had never been registered. And when they got pulled over, they also did not have their driver's license with them. They did not have proof of insurance. They did not have their registration. And they were driving on the wrong side of the road. It, there was a whole bunch of small things that should be fairly simple and pretty pretty easy to do that led to the, the action that the FAA took on it experience and working with the FAA, I, I've done that a few times. Their heart, their goal, and their desire is to educate people. They don't want to take action against people. They have, I've seen them offer a tremendous amount of grace to people that just didn't know. But this is things that, especially as large of a company as this was, this is things they should have known. And for more information and key takeaways from Adam, we posted a link to the case in the article for this episode on notillfarmer.com. Moving on, John Stevens says his corn had front row seats on the struggle bus because Mother Nature just wasn't cooperating. But the Rock Creek, Minnesota native made some last minute adjustments to get his corn back on track. And as he explains in our video of the week here, those adjustments likely saved his crop. Instead of just throwing on all the nitrogen at one time, and then again, just sitting on the pontoon all summer, and, <laughs> and just like, I hope we have a good crop, let's put in the effort, let's work extra hard, let's invest a little bit into this crop, and... Uh, and so then we came back, we did a V3 to V5 uh, foliar feed to complement the macro nutrients that were spread out here in that foliar feed. Do your own reading and research on V3 to V5 on corn. Uh, there's, there's many, 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 many trials out there showing that is a significant point of influence and it's paying off. Um, it's, it's very much paying off. We are green to the ground. Some of the old growth leaves still show the damage, but we are green to the ground. Here I've been pacing back and forth. Um, you don't have to go very deep into the soil and you run into moisture. Stevens, who no-tills and strip-tills, says he added about an extra 50 pounds of nitrogen on his second pass because a lot of his corn was still playing catch-up after a slow start. 
All right, that'll do it for this week. Email me your story ideas in Newman at LesterMedia.com. And before we go, we're going to send it out to Dave Hula for a preview of his upcoming National Strip Tillage Conference presentation. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day. Hello, I'm Dave Hula here at Rimwood Farms, located in Charles City, Virginia, on the north banks of the James River. I'm looking forward to my time to present at the National Strip Till Conference at Madison, Wisconsin on August 8th. During that session, I look forward to sharing some of the stories that we've had from going from a no-till or never-till situation to incorporating their soil warrior and doing some strip tilling. While we're there, we'll talk about how one can improve one's ROI, how one can manage their inputs. And in this day's economy, there's many things that we have to focus on. But we have to watch your dollars going into the crop, and then we also have to make sure we're producing more bushels. Now, whether or not if you're in a 150 bushel yield environment to a 300 plus bushel yield environment, there are attributes with the soil warrior and other strip tilling pieces of equipment that can influence your crop so that you can finish it after you get it off to a good start. While we're at the National Strip Till Conference, we'll get a chance to have some networking with other growers. We get a chance to have some learning sessions with not only the academic folks, but also the industry. And then, as most farmers like to do, we like to see some shiny new paint. So I'm sure I'll be out there standing next to one of the new strip tillers there from the ETS. And then there's going to be a lot of other technologies there from the other agribusiness industry. So I look forward to seeing y'all in Madison, Wisconsin. And may God bless each and every one of y'all.